So let's, let's get right into it. So observables. All Ember objects are observable. Uh, basically, what this, uh, what this functional functionality allows you to do is it, it allows one object to observe changes to properties in another object. Um, so this is actually, um, if, you, if you come from like a Cocoa background, does anybody here do mobile development, iOS stuff, um, or like Mac desktop stuff, this is called KVO. It's basically the same thing. It's like, I've got an object here, I've got a function here that I need to call whenever something on that object changes, so I need to observe changes on that object. Um, it's already mixed into all Ember objects. Um, it, it kind of mimics ES7's object.observe, which is like this future API that may or may not get here in a couple of years. Um, <clears throat> today, it's unfortunately, it still requires you to use kind of these getters and setters, kind of like backbone. So I can't just magically like update a property on an object. I have to say like get or set, um, as in this example. So check out this example. So I've got this user, uh, this is like a class, and it extends Ember object. So all instances of user are also going to be instances of Ember object. Uh, this class only has one property, name, uh, which defaults to null. Uh, and so I say, I say, let's create a new user, and let's add an observer to that user uh, for the name property, which is basically just this function that is going to run any time that name property gets changed. So then the very last thing I do is I could set this name property to Michael Jackson, and that observer callback is going to get called when that happens. Um, so this, this, this is very, very low level stuff. You don't usually say add observer a lot in Ember, but it's there just so you know. Um, and a lot of the features that we're going to be talking about from this point forward actually build on this functionality, okay? Uh, so computed properties are the second part of the runtime that I think is really interesting and really powerful. Uh, computed properties are basically this way to declaratively say, um, I've got a property that derives its value from some other properties on this object. And notice how that happens. It happens using observables, right? So I could say, I've got, um, so these computed properties, they automatically change when other uh, properties change. So in this case, I've got a computed property. We're just expanding on our, on our case from before. I've got a computed property called display name. Um, and in, the, in this case, uh, you'll notice that Ember mixes in this property function to the, uh, to the function prototype. You can use Ember without uh, extending native prototypes, but uh, this is the most common way to use it. So you'll say, I've got this display name property. It derives its value from the name and the handle properties. So what it does internally is it sets up observers on those two properties. And whenever the name or the handle properties update, the display name property updates. Um, now, its value is actually cached, right? So if you need to get this thing multiple times uh, and either the name or the handle property have not updated, it will just return the cached value. So that's where the observers come in because it's able to observe these properties and it only invalidates that cache when those properties change. Make sense? So this is actually a really powerful feature. You can say, uh, for example, I'm creating a, a user uh, with the handle edijkstra, and then uh, on the line beneath I say, get the display name, and in that case, uh, we'll call the that's, since that's the first time we got that property, we actually call our display name uh, function to, to go and figure out its value. Uh, return this.getName or this.getHandle. Well, it doesn't have a name, so that's going to be null. So in this case, we'll return the handle. Does that make sense? Everybody follow that? Okay, so then we're going to say on the next line, uh, second line to the bottom, user set name uh, Edgar Dykstra. Okay, and we set the user's name. And now, when we go and get the display name, uh, the user does have a name, so that is the new value of the computed property. So this stuff is actually really cool when you build it up uh, and you get to like, kind of a more complex example. So let's check out this example here. Um, let's say we have a conversation object, and it's got an array of messages. It it's, it's by default, it's null, but that's eventually going to be an array of messages. Second property down is a message count. So this is basically uh, just the number of things in the messages array. 
So it can be its own property on the conversation object, its own property that can be observed by other properties. Um, similarly, we have this has messages property, which is just a Boolean value, which derives its value from the message count. So if message count is zero, when zero is converted to a Boolean, that's false. But any other number converted to a Boolean is true, right? So has messages is going to watch the message count variable and get its, its value from that. So we kind of have these cascading updates, right? Which is really cool because we can just change our object directly and these computed properties, which are dependent on the properties that we're changing, will update as well. So check this out in our, in our example. We say var conversation is create conversation.create. We initialize it with an array of messages. <coughs> three objects in there, three strings. So uh, next line down, we'll say conversation, you know, tell me your message count, it's three. Um, conversation.get has messages, that's true, okay? Does everybody see how that works? Uh, and then on the next line, we're going to completely wipe the array of messages, okay? So conversation.set messages to empty array. Now, when we say get your message count, it's zero. And when we say, when we ask it if it has messages, it says false, okay? So that's pretty cool, I think, personally. Um, you don't have to go in and, 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 and update sort of all the properties of your object one by one, sort of manually. Um, instead, you can just update one property and the rest who are observing that property in some way will also get updated. Uh, so again, this is, you know, observers, computed properties are kind of one step above that. Um, this might be a little bit difficult to read, but this is a screenshot of the Ember docs. And uh, so in the last slide, we saw computed.bool, for example. Um, and Ember is just full of these computed property helpers. Um, you've got uh, properties like, um, you know, computed.any, which will like, for example, take an array and it will be true if any of the if any of those other properties are true, or have a truthy value. Um, you'll have things like computed.map, which basically is able to take an array and anytime that array ch changes, um, it will basically compute a new array that is some mapping function over that item. Um, so this is really cool because what we're doing is on that level. Uh, is we're observing changes to an array and just calling this map function on the incremental changes that happen in that array. Um, so let's take a look at like a filter function. So these are, this one's actually one that I use quite often. Um, uh, notice, okay, so we've, we've got our conversation object again, except we've changed it a little bit. This time we've got a current user ID property, a messages property, which holds our messages. And then we've got the sent messages computed property. So this is cool because this is a filter on the messages property. As messages uh, are added or removed from the messages array, we have another array called sent messages, which uh, is basically a filter on that incremental adding or removing. Does that make sense? So this all builds on the observer's API as well. You're observing the array, you're observing changes to the array down low, and then you get, uh, you're able to do this kind of functionality. So uh, let's say, for example, uh, you know, in, in, we say var conversation is conversation.create. Our current user has an ID of A, and then stick a bunch of messages in. Uh, two of those messages have a sender ID of A. You'll notice in our filter function, that's what we're checking for. We're checking to see if the sender ID is the same as the current user ID. And those we're terming are sent messages. Uh, so we'll say conversation.getSentMessages.length uh, is two. Sent messages is, a, is an array of two objects, the ones whose current user ID is A. Uh, and then we'll actually add a new object to the messages array. Uh, sender ID is A, give it some text, whatever. And now when we ask it for its sent messages, we have three. So this is, uh, this is actually the stuff that powers uh, what we'll be talking about next, which is bindings. So uh, for example, let, let's imagine you were displaying this conversation on a page. <clears throat> or imagine you were getting like, you were building Twitter and you had like a bunch of tweets and you had a big array of tweets and you wanted to show, you know, how many times that tweet was liked or something like that, right? You could have a like count on the tweet 
and you could have, um, what you need then is you need a way to get that like count into the page or you need a way to get that message count into the page. You need a way to display these properties that you're computing on these objects in the DOM. And that's where bindings come in. So binding, an, an ember.binding object is basically this object that encapsulates uh, some observable behavior. Um, so it, it can be one way or two way. So that's an interesting property of bindings. We'll, get, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But basically a one way binding is a binding that only receives changes from some other property. And a two way binding is a binding that uh, receives changes from some other property, but you can also set it and that change will trickle back uh, to the property that it, it, that it is mirroring. Um, so bindings, most of the time, you don't actually have to think about this at a very, very low level. Um, they're mostly created for you using handlebars templates. So you just put your little like mustache things in your handlebars templates, um, and they're used to keep the DOM in sync with changes in your models. So take a look at this example here. Um, so we've got three snippets of code here. The first two, well, they're all just script tags that you might find in a web page. Uh, the first one is uh, a handlebars template. Who's familiar with handlebars, by the way, or mustache? You've kind of used, you probably use some like ERB or PHP or some kind of templating language in the past where you just interpolate variables. That's all that's going on here. Um, so in our second template down, we're saying for each item in the model, render this list item element, this li. Um, and, uh, and, and that's it. And so in our application, so I'm looking at the last code snippet at the bottom. We've got this array of colors. Um, ignore the route thing for now. We're actually going to talk about that later as well. But I basically, that model property of the route corresponds to the model that you see up in the template there. And I'll say for each item in the model, render an li. So anytime that model gets updated, take for example the, the second to last line in the last example, I say add object to the colors array, add an object called green. So that's going to update uh, and put a new li in the DOM. Make sense? So the last feature of the runtime that I think is, is pretty cool is this run loop. And just similar to bindings where you don't actually have to create them, but you understand how they work at least, um, this run loop is, is similar to that. You don't actually like create the run loop. Ember just will create that for you um, and it will manage things. So the reason we've got this run loop is because uh, changes to the DOM are expensive, right? Anytime you touch the DOM, it's expensive. Where you, where you're inserting elements or whether you're changing attributes on elements that are already in the page, that's the slow bottleneck of most web apps. And a naive approach is to just sort of, as the data changes, go the, to the DOM and change it, right? A smarter approach is to say, okay, we've got all these changes in our data, we've got all these changes in memory, let's queue those up, and when the browser has some free time, maybe request animation frame, or maybe, um, you know, just some time when we, when we, the wind is more convenient um, than right now, we'll just flush all of those updates to the DOM at the same time. And this can also be very advantageous. For example, if you have a property in an object and say you change it three times very, very quickly in rapid succession before any of them are changed to the DOM, or sorry, flushed to the DOM, uh, only the last value will actually be flushed to the DOM. Does that make sense? So it's more efficient. Instead of having three writes to the DOM, we've only got one in this case. Um, and like I said, if this, if this stuff is kind of seeming like, wow, that's, that's, that's cool, but how do I manage that? Don't worry about it because Ember actually will manage all this for you. Um, but it's important to understand that it's there and, and how it works. <coughs> um, oh, you should also use this run loop if you're kind of like, I, had, I didn't have to use this until I kind of got further into Ember, but you should also probably use the run loop instead of doing like a set timeout um, because the run loop helps you like coalesce things together. Um, there are several, uh, there are several like important run loops in Ember. Probably the most common ones that you'll come across in your day to day are the render and the after render queues. Um, so render is, um, is the queue that contains all of the jobs that actually need to modify the DOM. And then after render contains all of the jobs that will run immediately after the DOM has been modified. So if you have some property or something in your application that depends on DOM state for some reason, 
Uh, you stick it in the after render queue, and you know that uh, when that queue runs, the DOM will be up to date. So that's kind of cool. So just to review uh, the, the kind of this last portion, the runtime, right? We've got observables, we've got computed properties, we've got bindings, and then we've got these queues in the run loop. Um, so this, when you, when, you, when you get all these tools like this, it, it kind of makes you feel like you have superpowers, right? You're doing your JavaScript, your day-to-day -day JavaScript, and all of a sudden I can like observe a property to know when something changes. Or I can just have something magically update in the DOM when the property changes, right? And it's done in an efficient manner for me, right? So these, what, what Ember uh, helps you do is it helps you to be more productive because you're not micromanaging these things anymore. You, you, have these, um, you, have these, you have these more powerful tools. You have more leverage. Uh, the second part that I think is the huge productivity win in Ember, and this is where Ember really, really shines, um, is in managing flows and in managing different screens. Now, up, up to this point, you might have been looking at this and thinking, yeah, you know, I've got the same thing in like Backbone, or I've, I've got the same thing in some other frameworks, and you'd be right. Um, the ideas of, of bindings, the ideas of you know, observers and you know, computed properties are mostly derived from uh, stuff that already exists. A lot of it's derived from Cocoa and KVO. You know, you've got bindings and things like Angular, et cetera. Um, but flows um, and, and managing, managing flows is the place where I really think that Ember shines and it's, it's the huge productivity booster for me. So what am I talking about when I'm talking about flows? So I, I came across, um, oh, by the way, I have to give credit to uh, Tom and Yehuda, who are kind of the main, uh, two of the main authors of Ember for this next part of the presentation because uh, they helped me to understand a lot of this with their keynote at EmberConf. So there's, there was this uh, article uh, by Ryan Singer of 37 Signals, uh, what formerly 30, 37 Signals, they're now called Basecamp. He basically wrote this article and he's talking about flows. He's talking about designing UI flows. And I wanted to zoom in on this, this paragraph here. He said, flows are just as important to good interface um, as individual screens are. Customers don't land on screens from out of nowhere. Specific sequences of actions lead customers through your app as they try to accomplish their tasks. Um, and so, so he has like this shorthand that he uses when he's designing flows. And anybody who's built a, a, an app here has probably had some sort of similar system, right? Whether it's like storyboards or like just boxes on a, on a whiteboard or, or flashcards or whatever. You're looking through, you're saying, okay, user is going to land on such and such a page. In this case, um, this is the flow for the, you know, resetting their password. So he says, the user lands on the login screen. A couple of things could happen. Maybe they forgot their password, in which case we need to go and you know, have a way to remind them. Um, maybe the login was not successful and we need to tell them that there was an error. Uh, best case is the login uh, was successful and we move them on. But in case they did forget their password, we're in like the bottom flow there, we go to the forgot password screen. Uh, then they enter their email. We send them a reset password email, they click on the link, they come back to some other screen, maybe that allows them to change their password, right? Welcome back, maybe it automatically logs them in, maybe it doesn't. I was using a web app the other day where I got a password reset email, I clicked on the link, I changed my password, and then it took me to another page that said, congrats, now you can log in with your new password. And I was like, that's dumb, right? I just typed my password twice. Like, why, why am I not in? Why did you take me to a new page where I now have to type that password, which I didn't actually type because it was like some random thing that one password generated for me. So I have to like click on one password and like figure out what it is, you know? This stuff matters, right? UI flows matter to your users. The thing about this is it is hard. It really, really is hard. It's silly, but it is hard to add new pages to a web app in a way that makes sense. If you don't believe me, let's go and check out, let's go and check out, um, let's check out some, ex well, I actually don't have a ton of time. We'll check out some examples later. Uh, let's ask ourselves a few questions about, about flows. 
Um, ask yourself now, in the app that you're building, how easy is it to add a new screen or a new page to your web app? How easy is it to link from one page of your app to another? This is something that's super common on the web, right? If you go to a, any web page, you'll see hundreds of links. I mean, they're thrown all over the place. You've got URLs going here and there. How easy is that for you to do in an app? Now, remember, we're talking about Ember, which is kind of this, this holistic approach to web development. It's, uh, it's uh, managing all of these different screens for you. How, how well does your current stack do that? Um, how do you actually make transitions from one page to another that actually make sense? Do you, do you preserve portions of the existing page, like some of the Chrome that you've got around the existing page? Or do you throw the whole thing away and like re-render the entire page like we did when we were doing uh, server rendered apps? See, that's the nice, really, really nice thing about like PHP, for example, or just like rendering your app on the server, is because with every request to the server, you get, you get all of the data in one place, you get all, you get everybody in the room, you've got the session, you've got the user object, you've got the queries you make to the database and the stuff that you need to display on the page, and you've got everybody in the same place, and then you render your template and you spit it out, right? It's very, very easy to kind of think about things when it all comes together in the same place and time like that. But when you're on the client and you're trying to persist state to the client, you gotta think about this. How does that happen? When, uh, when I only need to update a piece of the UI, how do we get that new data? How does that piece update in a way that makes sense, that doesn't break things like the back button, right? Um, can users share URLs from your app? How many people have are building web apps where users can actually share like rich client side HTML5 apps where the users can share your URLs. That's awesome. You guys are totally to be commended for that because that is a hard problem uh, to solve. Um, I really want to show an example, but I'm not sure that I've got the Wi-Fi here. Hold on. So I was, I was using, uh, I want, to show a, I want to show a good example of this and a bad example of this. So I was actually using uh, S3 the other day. I was like on Amazon, S3. How many people use S3? Right? It's pretty common, right? It's this, uh, let me see if we can, let's see if we can, we can open up my S3 account. Let's see. Yeah, it's this, it's this web app that's like built by by you know this massive company with like tons of resources and they've got you know for sure they've got like an amazing web app right so you go to your s3 console you're like okay great i see all this stuff first of all you had like that loading thing which was weird but now you're here so oh snap hold on thank you by the way for telling me about that now do you see it okay so let's say i'm in my i'm in my s3 bucket Okay, and I'm like, this works more or less like a, a file browser, right? So I click on a bucket and then it loads some more stuff. I've got this loading indicator up here to show me this stuff is loading. Oh, okay, cool, so I've got more stuff. Let me like browse into, I don't know, I'll browse into this like avatars thing. Let me click on that. It's just gonna load some data there. So far this is a pretty nice experience, right? I've got this loading indicator up here that me when things are going on when it's fetching data. I've got this, this Chrome up here that kind of stays consistent and just the data loads down below so the whole page doesn't blow away. So then I'm like, okay, well, cool. Let me head back to my home files directory. So I'm like the most logical place for me to go is to hit the back button, right? I want to go back. I want to go back to what I was looking at before. So I hit my back button and then it's like the whole thing is blown away. Now I'm at my S3 console page again or not, not even my S3 console, I'm at my AWS console, which is like even one step before that. Uh, so contrast that with a really, really great example of you know, people who are doing this the right way. Let's take a look at, uh, let's take a look at GitHub. Uh, so let's say, for example, I'm, I'm browsing around github.com, I'm checking out the Ember.js stuff, I'm like, oh, this is cool. Uh, so I'm gonna go to the Ember.js repo. 
Um, so in this case, you know, I've loaded up the repo. I'm like, this looks great. Let me check out some of the pull requests. So notice that I've got this, this UI that's sort of up top that is more or less staying the same. I've got my username. You know, I've got I've got you know stuff information about the repo and stuff. Notice though this state changed. That's cool. So like now instead of searching across everything, I'm, it, it knows that I'm in a specific repo. So now I'm now the search is like scoped to just that repo. So now I've got all kinds of stuff on the page. Remember how we were talking about links? I've got like there are probably at least a hundred links here that we that we're looking at right now. Um, I could like click on this button, which is just showing me closed issues. Um, so again, this state of the page remained pretty consistent up top, but now just this piece has changed. Um, so let me, you know, find just issues that mention or that are assigned to Robert Jackson. You know, so again, now, I'm, now I've got this filter on the left and I'm just updating this section of the page. Uh, let me click into one. So now I've like kind of updated the page, right? I'm like at a brand new URL, right? What happens if I hit the back button? I go back to where I was. I go back to just pull requests that are assigned to that person, right? That's pretty awesome. How many people think that's pretty awesome and useful? Like as a user, that's great, right? Truth is, most web apps don't do this. Most web apps are not this fluent, okay? So this is kind of what we're aiming to build, right? So what are the tools that help us build that? Um, Thank you for bearing with me on my tangent. Now I'm going to get back to, back, to this, uh, back to the presentation because I really think uh, this is where Ember shines. So we're thinking about flows. We're thinking about how to do this. Ember ships with what's called a router. Okay? So the router is basically this piece that encapsulates, um, it encapsulates routing logic, and it, it, it decides which pieces of code to run based on what is in the URL. And by the way, when you're clicking around and transitioning to different pieces in your app, as we were doing on GitHub, the router is responsible for updating the URL and or like updating state. Um, so we do this declaratively. We just, we map it out like a bunch of routes. May, some people have probably used Rails, like the Rails router. It's very similar to that. Um, you just basically match on a URL and go run a certain controller. Um, so like I said we've got this transition to mechanism for navigating between routes and then, uh, and then it takes care of updating the, the URL for us. So what does this look like? So um, looks kind of like this. <laughs> Uh, so notice one of the cool things that I that I really like about Ember's router is first of all changing between using like the hash or using HTML5 history is actually really easy. Uh, so notice in the first block up there, I just say um, you know my my router the app dot router is the instance of my router, and I say okay instead of using hash which is the default, um, use look use uh, HTML5 history um, to manage the to manage the state. And just like that, I've gone from using hash-based URLs to HTML5 history URLs. Now, you, you probably have to change some stuff on your server, right, when that happens, to make sure that when you are in these nested, uh, when you are at some path in your application, um, that you're still serving up your Ember app and that you're not, you don't get like a 404, right, when you're using HTML5 history. But it's, on the front end, it's this easy to do this. Um, so what does it look like? I said it declaratively maps URLs to pieces of code. So that's uh, this next block. So I've, I've got this call to app.router.map. And inside here, I've, I'm nesting resources. So I basically say, um, uh, you know, I've got a resource called the kiosk, which in my app actually describes a piece of UI. It's like a smaller window um, that we use as like, we use it for doing like logins and, and uh, like password recovery and stuff like that. Um, and then within that UI, there are like, you know, a couple of different forms that we could possibly show the user based on what they're doing, based on what, what state they're in. Um, <clears throat> I've got this other kind of top level resource called the inbox. So this is for like a, a chat app that I'm building. Um, 
And this, uh, this resource actually doesn't appear in the URL. So we've got, it's mounted at the, the path slash. That's what that's all about. And then it's got resources, resources that are nested inside of it. Um, so basically, whenever I hit a URL, <clears throat> say I hit uh, slash slash uh, the chat's resource. Say, say I've just got a slash. I just hit the root URL. Um, that's going to go and it's going to find my chat's controller, basically, and run the code that's in that. If I hit slash mentions, it's going to go find my mentions controller and run the code that's inside of that. Um, so there's one uh, route here that's, that's uh, interesting, and uh, it's the chat route. So the one that I use to actually display like an individual conversation that you might be having with some people. So it's the second one down in my, in in my inbox block, this.resource chat. And then its path is slash chats slash chat ID. And that chat ID is like a placeholder in the URL that I get in, uh, in my parameters. So let's take a look at, at what that looks like. So you've got this route object that is actually the one that's responsible for, for running the code and rendering the page whenever a, certain, whenever a user hits a certain URL. Um, and in this case, I've got a couple of hooks here. Um, number one is I've got this, so I've got this before model and I've got this model hook. Those are the two that I'm going to be focusing on right now. The before model hook is something that basically says, uh, before anything else runs on this page, like, do this. It's just a way for you to, it's usually a no op unless you need to do something. So in this case, I'm saying, is the user signed in? If they're not, redirect them to the sign in page. The cool thing about this before model uh, hook is that it gets a, like a transition argument, which is basically an argument that you'll notice I'm passing it to my, my redirect to sign in method. It's basically a, a, an, an object that I can use to rerun the transition that the user was trying to do when we redirected them. Does that make sense? So like, uh, Say you were going to this website and you were trying to view a specific chat, you're trying to view a specific conversation, but oh, you're not logged in. So it sends you to the login page. Uh, you log in, and then as soon as you do log in, it takes you back to the conversation, right? It doesn't take you like to the home page or someplace, right? That's a great experience. That's thinking about our flows. That's thinking about our users. Um, so this is the, why I really think this is one of the gems of Ember because it makes this stuff easy and manageable. So redirect them to the sign-in page. Uh, we're not going to talk about controllers and views today, but basically I've got like the sign-in controller, uh, and, and you'll recognize that dot set notation. I'll say your attempted transition is this transition object, and then transition to the sign-in page. When I'm done with the sign-in, in my sign-in controller, it's got an attempted transition object. Once sign-in is successful, just retry the transition, right? And it doesn't need to know, like, what was the URL? What was the thing that they were trying to do? All it knows is I've got this transition object. This encapsulates the state of whatever the user was trying to do when they first came to my site. Just rerun it because now we believe that they should be able to rerun that transition. That's beautiful. Like the way that the, the way the abstraction works there, I think is great. Okay, so assuming they are signed in, assuming we don't redirect them in the before model hook, we just hop down to the model hook. And now it's like, OK, so what is the model? What is the data that we want to display on this page? So uh, in this case, we've got like this chat find by ID method. And we get this hash of params. Remember in the route, we had that slash chats slash colon chat ID. Uh, that, that params object is going to have a chat ID property uh, that it just pulled right out of the URL. So then we, we pull that out and we say that that is the model for our route. Now we have to go back a ways when I was showing you, uh, you know, the dot dot here, remember this page? So now we understand a little bit more what this route is doing and what that model hook is doing. Um, in this case, I'm totally ignoring the params in the model hook uh, just for simplicity's sake, but you know, that's essentially what that model hook is responsible for doing, is, is responsible for designating some data that is going to be rendered by your template. Uh, let's see. Okay. So we were here. Okay, so are there any questions about 
this piece because I really want to make sure that we get this piece kind of nailed. This is, this, is, this is the important piece of Ember that a lot of apps just don't get right. Um, if I, if I, what happens if I hit the back button in this app? If I go to a certain route and I hit the back button? Let's walk through it. So the router that's watching the URL is going to notice the change. Or if I'm using HTML5, like it's going to either notice the hash change, or if I'm using HTML5 history, it's going to notice the pop state event. Um, and it's going to take that, and it now has a URL that it can dispatch on, right? And it can say, uh, who, who's the route for this URL, right? Who needs to manage this? Meanwhile, the current route that I'm in, this chat route, gets this will transition action, right? So it knows, oh, the router has now decided that I am old news. Okay, I'm going away. This route is going away. Uh, and we're going to transition away from it into something else. So it actually has the opportunity in this will transition hook to do some stuff. Uh, this is actually a hook that I use to do things like enqueuing transition animations. Right? If, if, say, I've got like a master detail view and I'm in the detail uh, and I hit the back button like in an iOS app, I'm transitioning out of that and so I'll get this will transition hook where I can transition, I can like enqueue a, a sliding animation, for example. Are there any questions about kind of how the router works or how Ember makes, um, makes it easy to manage things like the URL and which code runs based on the URL? Yeah? Exactly, yeah, it contains information about the trans, like, yeah, the page that they were going to, the, pr the parameters that were in the URL. So when you retry that transition, I, I'm sorry I omitted it, I should have put it in here, but when you retry that transition, it basically starts at the top again and says, okay, you know, here are the params, let's, let's render this page now. Yeah. Um, does this look useful? Does this look like a piece that, could help you provide a better user experience to build an ambitious web app. This is, this is really like the key innovation of, of Ember, in my opinion. Uh, it makes you not afraid to add a new page to your app, right? When you sit down in a discussion with the design team and they say, you know, we did that flow last week, that like password recovery flow, and you know, like it's just not working out, so we want to try this different flow. All right, we, instead of going to page A, B, and C, we want to go to B first and then go to D and then come back to A. In a lot of web frameworks or a lot of app kind of experiences that I've uh, t just played with, especially client side stuff, in server side stuff, it's not bad at all, right? You just put a link to the page and your server knows how to generate every single page. But in client side stuff, this gets super difficult and it can really get. Uh, buggy if you don't have a consistent way for managing changes to the URL and propagating changes that happen in the page, propagating transitions between screens back to the URL. Also, this ensures that we always have um, shareable URLs. I want to go back to my thinking about flow slide because I really think that this router solves a lot of these questions for us. Um, when I transition, the Ember router automatically takes care of updating the URL for me so I can just copy and paste that URL to anybody. I remember uh, being so frustrated like in the early days of, uh, was it Google Maps? Like really early on, like didn't have shareable URLs. It, they had like this special link thing or maybe it wasn't, I feel bad for calling them out when I'm not 100% sure it was them. It, it might have been them, but I, anyway, you like to have shareable URLs. Um, also, it doesn't, it doesn't seem, yeah. Is all the state held in the transition? If you change state going from one to the next and then you go back. Yeah. So the transition object is just kind of this lightweight thing that you get when you're making a transition. It's like the router says, oh, we're making a transition, create a transition object that we can pass to the before model thing if somebody cares about that, right? But then you don't really keep that around for too much longer. It just goes away. Because as soon as you use a, a transition, um, so I had a point here on the third bullet 
Uh, we've got a transition to mechanism. We've also got like these link to helpers in our handlebars templates, which just use transition to. And so basically everything, anything that makes a transition in the page, it always goes back to the router. Just goes back to the router and says, this is the new URL. You know, handle this. And then the router decides, okay, which pieces of the page need to update. It's also really easy to do things like nested UI in this case. Um, the exact same way that things are nested in your router declaratively is the way that UI is nested in your app. Um, that's actually kind of a key to using Ember that took me a while to figure out. Uh, just in case you're interested, that's, that's an important piece of info there. Um, okay, so it's probably about time for me to wrap up. Um, if you're interested in any of the stuff that we talked about today, I've got all the examples, I've got all these slides up on GitHub. Here's the URL. Um, thanks. Oh, I think we might have like two, two or three minutes for questions. If anybody has some questions, yeah. Talked a lot about the stuff you like about Ember. What don't you like about Ember? Are there any things that it might be lacking in versus like the backbone? Or Excellent question. So the gentleman asks, uh, you know, I've talked, I've said a lot of good stuff about Ember. What don't I like about Ember? <clears throat> um, and you know, it's funny. I was talking to a buddy of mine on the way up. One of the things that I don't like about it is, is that it does take such a holistic approach. Like, it can be nice if you like that. If you like Rails, you'll love Ember, right? It's just like, I don't have to think about a lot of this stuff, and it just kind of does it for me. Um, and Rails has gotten more pluggable over the years, to its credit, but it used to be that you like use Rails and that was it. But uh, Ember, it does feel like this very heavyweight thing sometimes that, that definitely does take control of everything. Like I said, some people like that, some people don't. It's a preference of mine to use things that are more kind of pluggable. Um, but, you know, I, I, I don't find that it bothers me too much in Emberland. Um, but yeah, excellent question. In the back. Yep. So, so it, uh, take a look at the HTML5 history API. So basically, uh, some, some websites, it was, it was kind of a popular technique for several years to uh, just use a hash in the URL, which is basically like the pound sign. Everything after the hash, the browser doesn't actually send to the server when it requests a page. So JavaScript heavy apps would use that to decide which portion of the page they needed to run, as opposed to HTML5 history API, which actually modifies the real URL. Um, and so in that case, if I did copy and paste that URL to somebody, that whole URL would be sent to my server, which is why I said it's important to remember when you're building these client side apps, um, that when you get, you know, and you're using HTML5 history API, when you get a nested URL, you need to be sure to always serve your app, even though the URL is not the root URL. Does that make sense? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, well, no, sorry. Changing the URL using HTML5 history API does not invoke a new request. It just changes the URL. If you were to like copy and paste that URL to somebody else, that would that would make a new request, right? But I mean, it's it should the idea is it should be totally transparent. Like it, I, I I shouldn't have this hash in the URL. I should just have a URL. I can copy and paste it. It'll update when when I'm navigating around the page. Like it's it, it works more or less like a server side app, except it's all client side. Makes sense. Yeah. I'm just curious. So I've noticed in, in your uh, router map, you yep. Uh, routes and resources? Yeah, instead of routes, yeah. yeah. Is there a reason for that choice? So the, so the question is, uh, I was using the resource uh, method in my router, uh, there it is, instead of the route. Um, so, I mean, like, I get using this resource for the outer. Yeah, so this basically, uh, yeah, this is just a thing that helps me in my link to helpers. So instead of saying link to inbox.chats, I can just say link to chats, okay. for example. Yeah. Um, it's just, uh, it's just a way that I structured my app, but it's definitely not the only way. Right. Yeah, over here. Yeah, so how does, how does Ember deal with a partial page refresh instead of a full page refresh? Is that it? Yeah. 
So it, 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 comes back, it all comes back to the router, which is why I say the router is really the gem of Ember. Um, because if, I, if I'm navigating, for example, let's go back and take a look at my routes. Say, for example, I'm in like, oop, sorry. I'm just not used to this. Okay, say, for example, I'm in like my mentions route and I switch to my chats route. Notice how those are both sub-resources of the inbox resource. So I don't actually have to blow away the inbox to show that other thing, right? I can just go up to the router and the router will say, I can see the URL has changed, but the initial portion of the URL hasn't changed, just the kind of sub-portion after that. So only swap out the piece of the page that corresponds to that. And that's why I say that these nested resources correspond to nested UI. That's one of the real keys of Ember. Last question. Yeah, in the back. Uh, so you spoke about uh, using the router to uh, control state. I'm wondering about uh, other messaging patterns that for components communicating with each other. Yeah, so like, uh, yeah. So I didn't cover controllers at all today, but Ember basically has this, uh, it's basically like this dependency injection mechanism. They don't call it dependency injection like the Angular guys do. They call it, uh, needs, but it's basically a property on your controller where you say this controller needs some other controller. So I could say, for example, my my chat's controller needs the current user controller because it needs to know who the current user is, um, and that's how controllers can like include one another. Again, I, I apologize, I didn't go over controllers at all today. We only had 30 minutes, so it's kind of kind of a rush to get through it. But does that that make sense? You can you can you can wire up your controllers that way. No, no, no. You, you, you want to keep it within that as much as possible. Okay, thanks everybody.